cases, not just a whole lot of extra education with them, but we have some cases that are some great cases, and we have some that are some couple of maybe little hiccups that we can learn from. And I don't want this thinking that we're going, you know, we talked about years ago how we don't, we don't talk about bad things that happen in public, but guys, sometimes we can learn some great education from that. Uh, there, nobody will be identified, the medic, the, the uh, uh, anything like that, but we want to talk about some great educational things that we can learn from this. So as we start tonight, <clears throat> our first case, and I don't have my clicker. This will follow uh, for National Registry. It's going to be divided up a little bit more for state regulation. This will be some for air aid management, ventilation, a little bit of trauma, a little bit of medical. Once again, I'll take care of all of that. Remember, once again, if you are National Registered and you are due in March, a thir March 31st of this year, please uh, get with uh, either... Uh, Kim or myself, we do have to make a few small adjustments on your uh, CEs. We'll get that taken care of for you, okay? So first of all, uh, experience is building a house with time and sweat. Brick over brick and nail over nail, fingers are bruised and hammered, but eventually the house stands. Education shows us the benefit of a nail gun. So that's what we want to do is we want to build on the things that we currently do. So our objectives tonight is we'd like to review the uh, patient care provided by a traumatic arrest, quote unquote, and I'm going to talk about that, chest pain, respiratory, and allergic reaction. I want to consider the risk factors for acute coronary syndrome and uh, examine some of the proper assessments of these treatments. And then we want to examine some of the options uh, of uh, each of these cases as we present in education and Dr. Troutman uh, gives us his thoughts. So first and foremost, uh, we had a 70-ish male uh, had a, experienced a sinkable episode, and as what got reported was that a by somebody driving beside him reported that uh, this gentleman had gone what they thought unconscious. He had kind of slipped down his head and then drove through a residence. And you can see right here is a picture of actually the scene, all the way through the uh, the front wall and the back wall of the residence. The crew is very quick on scene. We tried to get this all the way from dispatch all the way through, through fire, but the, we didn't get a lot of information. Dispatch came from PD that, uh, that it was a motor vehicle accident and then they get there. As you can see, the car noted to go all the way through the residence at that time. <clears throat> the patient uh, was reported. Uh, as you can see right here, they did a great job documenting that the patient's head was slumped down. He, they thought he went unconscious and then struck uh, the house at that time after he left the roadway. So the crew arrives on scene and they find the patient on the ground outside of the vehicle. He's pulseless and apneic and they notify dispatch that we have a category 9 cardiac arrest at that point. Uh, you can see they assessed the patient very quickly, uh, rapid assessment, not finding a lot of trauma, just some small abrasions to the face, the left eye, not enough for you to think that the patient is in cardiac arrest. Now, I want to preface this by saying the crew did a great job here because at the first, technically that's a trauma arrest, and what are our times? Typically less than 10 minutes is what we want off the scene. But the guys had a great thought process of, of saying, what led up to this? So we're probably talking more medical arrest at this time. There was not a lot of trauma to the patient, therefore we probably knew it was a medical arrest. We've proven over the years that we can do appropriate CPR bouncing down the roadway. So they made the best decision and that was to stop right there and to work it. We understand technically this is a traumatic arrest, technically. But more than anything, we knew that this was a medical arrest and the crew recognized that quickly. So therefore they made the decision, they had a brief, uh, they started CPR immediately, a couple minutes later they do have a uh, Spontaneous circulation noted, and they have V fit. Then they get, they have VTAC and V fib on the monitor. So they started CPR. They got oxygen on board. Did a passive airway. Did a great job with that. Now, this call was before the last spinal update. So they elected to go ahead and put on a spine board because the patient was unconscious. That fell into that. You can't do the nexus criteria. Therefore that does fall into spinal uh, immobilization at that point. They do notice that, that we're two minutes in now. We, do, we are VTAC uh, with a pulse. We Indications for VTAC. They did a quick synchronized cardio version. 
Remember that we want to keep those parry shot times down. Now he wasn't in arrest at this point. We are only in VTAC. And when we defibrillate, or sorry, me, synchronize cardiovert him at 50 joules, we move into VFib. So now we start CPR, they drop an IO quick, and then they make the decision to defibrillate one minute later. I want to talk about that for just a minute because remember when we talk about our CPR paradigm that our ATP stays present for up to four minutes once they go into cardiac arrest. So I have ATP stores. Remember what happens when I don't have ATP present and I defibrillate it, what's going to happen? We're going to be in asystole because we don't have anything to work with. We don't have any nutrients going to that, cardio, that myocardial muscle. So at that point, they elected, they knew they had ATP present, they shocked him uh, at 120 joules, and the result remains in VFib. So you can see at this time, we have a very, very viable patient, because we have a very workable rhythm. Yes, I understand still, I want to make that point, this is technically a traumatic arrest, but they had a very strong suspicion this was a medical arrest. Therefore, they chose to stay on scene and do the right thing. They got Epi on board, another defibrillation, amiodarone on board, another defibrillation, lidocaine on board because we're not making any progress. We're staying in that constant v -fib. Remember, as we're doing CPR now, this is a big point because their perishock times were absolutely incredible. Remember, when I talk about perishock, that's from the time I stop my compressions, I defibrillate, and I get back to compressions. <clears throat> That ATP at that point only lasts about four seconds. We know we have to have ATP there in order to get a good defibrillation. So they, there are times, and I don't remember them off the top of my head exactly, but I want to say they were one and two seconds. Is that, they were incredible times. <clears throat> and so they stopped compressions, charged all the way through compressions, pulled off, shocked, and right back on. That gives the patient the proper CPP that we need, the coronary and cerebral pressure that they need to be a viable patient at that point. They are providing the nutrients, remember, back to the head, back to the heart, back to the myocardium, and they're getting the ATP there and the oxygen and the sugars to the brain and everything that needs to take place right now. They go right back into defibrillation once again, uh, lidocaine infusion, epi, they start their dopamine quick, and we get return of spontaneous circulation. We have a low blood pressure initially to start with. Uh, saturations aren't all that great when we're coming right out of a rest. Uh, <clears throat> but they're start, they've got dopamine on board and we get a 12 lead done and we notice we got a left bundle branch. Uh, so that kind of throws out us being able to totally diagnose the STEMI in the field. Uh, they have a patient that's now got pulses but is now starting to clench and starting to uh, uh, regain some type of consciousness, possibly some gag reflex here, so we make the decision to go into RSI for, uh, or PAI, excuse me, <laughs> young kids, I know I, I'm old in RSI, but we have uh, for airway protection, they use their automate, they use their succinylcholine, they get him intubated, blood pressure is still not great, so we get fentanyl on board, we provide oxygen, and we have blood pressure starting to increase now. I have very good I have very good end titles here, and so you can see that I have good perfusion. Guys, one of the main reasons, that, and I talk about this because this was a survivor patient, because the crew made a great decision of saying, by paper, we know we need to do this. But due to our protocols and your education, you put two and two together and said, no, I need to stay because I provide the CPP they need. I provided the ATP replacement in order to give this patient the <clears throat> best chance of survivability. And so then they made the decision to transport. Total time on scene was somewhere in the neighborhood of about 28 minutes. Is that correct, D? Somewhere in that neighborhood? <laughs> so, so you're talking you know, trauma arrest technically. You know, does this get a trauma activation? Probably you bet. Is that something we're going to have to defend at the end of the day? Probably so, but that's okay. Because we did the best thing for the patient at that time to replace the needs that they did, and the crew did a great job documenting that for protection, to, for, to cover, to explain why they did what they did. All right, well, I think we've really 
focused on the was this a trauma, was this a medical code, and I think Chad's done a good job about expressing <coughs> that we made the right call. You know, we thought it looked like a trauma call, but it didn't really smell like one, right? You know, cars generally just kind of off the road. That's oftentimes somebody passed out. It could be for a medical reason. You could even get into was it an intoxication or something of that nature. But we recognize that. We're an elderly person, um, so we do think this could be a medical arrest. So what are the two things that really increase survivability that we always talk about? High quality CPR, right, and early defib. Both of those happen here. I mean, we defib pretty quickly, and once that was noticed, I think within a few minutes, and got the patient back, delivered the patient to the hospital. So, you know, a lot of times we don't always find out exactly what happened to our patients. You know, we get into some HIPAA concerns and what have you. But tonight we kind of have a special guest here. We have Mr. Van Winkle in the back. This is the man we've been talking about. And if you guys don't think this Very is awesome, nice to be here. Very I think that's the coolest thing you've ever done. If you want to say anything, sir, feel, feel free. Well, I'd just like to tell everyone that uh, I'm glad of what you guys do. Whenever I see an ambulance now, a little prayer to you know, that didn't happen uh, a whole lot before, but I, I am uh, very appreciative. Thank you, sir. We know we, we talk about ROSC rates a lot, and, you know, ROSC is important, but we always also like to say we want to send people back to their families. That's what we like to, that's the outcome we go for. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, so guys, great case, great call, they made a good decision, okay? Was it a textbook, paper? Not, not necessarily, but they made a great judgment call here to do the right thing, and so that's why we wanted to bring Mr. Van Winkle in so y'all, he could say thank you. He, he expressed that he wanted to thank everybody as a whole uh, of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you guys. Uh, for uh, taking great care of our patients. So let's talk about our next call. Uh, we have an anaphylaxis, a 29 year old male who's conscious having severe anaphylaxis reaction. Now I wanna point out, it's being documented right here. And guys, this is one of these, nothing wrong with the way they quite did, but might have had some great room for improvement. We're gonna talk about that. They documented here Severe anaphylaxis, uh, according to the mother that the patient had the same reaction a month ago while cleaning out a storage building. Today he's cleaning out uh, the attic. Well, is what this would be to me is I'm not cleaning anything else out. But he had a severe uh, allergy. They prescribed an EpiPen because it was so severe last time. But as most of our patients, they didn't have it filled quite yet. Um, the mother gave the, the patient two 50 milligram of Benadryls prior to us arrival, our, us arrival, our arrival. The patient's about a 275 pound or 125 kilo male in his late 20s. Uh, at that time, once again, allergic reaction and no other significant medical history besides the previous anaphylaxis. So going into this with mom telling us he had an anaphylactic reaction a month ago, what do we know about our second anaphylactic reaction? It's always going to be pretty worse because why we built antibodies there and so that's going to progress and, and so that that keys us right now that we need to be aggressive everybody agree okay so we move in we get him on oxygen quickly fire department did a great job getting him on oxygen um, he was flush and hive started to form uh, throughout the body we notice that we're also hypotensive we have a high heart rate so cardiac monitor uh, gets put on pretty quickly. <clears throat> we get an IV established. We get a blood draw. We start him with Benadryl. And so now he's already had 50 and 50. So he's at 100 of Benadryl PO, which we know how long it's gonna take. How long to start working? A little bit of time, 20, 30 minutes. So they went ahead and being more aggressive, put the IV, uh, gave that, was very aggressive with the uh, Decadron right now, and get that added in and blood pressure starts to come up some and heart rate still 132. 
Then they make the decision to go ahead and go with the epi IM. Now, reading this report, knowing this is a second reaction, I probably would have been a little more aggressive with epinephrine a little earlier. But then the argument comes in, well, the heart rate's already 166. Can they tolerate it? Well, you've got a fairly young male, healthy heart, no other history, that you know probably would be a little safer. Why is his heart rate so high and his blood pressure so low? It's clamping down, exactly. And so, I, you know, at this point, you've got to, they kind of weigh that, and they were a little bit scared to give that epinephrine at a high heart rate of 166. It wasn't the heart rate. It wasn't the heart rate? Blood pressure. Blood pressure being so low? Okay. And so we kind of weigh that, and you kind of go, well, you know, but is, is hypotension one of the side effects to it? It is. And so we know we have to stop that with it being a second reaction. Like I said, you saw when they got the Benadryl on board, they got the Decadron on board, we had a rise. And we had a lower in our heart rate and a rise in our blood pressure. So they're making progress there, but they're probably not getting the full result they wanted of the, of the respiratory at that point. Or the anaphylaxis, you got the hive still growing. Um, <clears throat> so at that point, they gave the epinephrine, uh, <clears throat> then they gave the flamotidine. They also had to give a little Zofran for some nausea. Remember that we always, don't always remember that nausea is part of anaphylaxis a lot of times because of the gut reaction. But that is a number, uh, big indicator of an anaphylaxis reaction. So you can see they went ahead and gave the flamotidine, they gave the uh, Zofran. <clears throat> Pressure comes up very nicely now, 150 over 101. Heart rate's coming down, oxygen saturations are good. Um, patient's doing much better, feeling better. And so some of the points we wanted to talk about is that the benefits of IM, uh, yet a tough decision, with elevated heart rate and low blood pressure. Oh, go ahead, sorry, this is yours. Yeah, no, that's fine. Sorry. Good job. So I just keep going. You mentioned concern about the low blood pressure. So remember, in true <clears throat> anaphylaxis, that's what tends to happen. You know, kind of everything dilates, and you often get hypotensive. And what is epinephrine, if we just, if I just shoot some epi in me right now, what potentially is gonna happen? Blood pressure is gonna raise a little bit, right? I mean, that can be used essentially that's probably the purest form of a presser that there is. So this guy had obvious hives, and the comment I think he's 20 something years old, so healthy heart. I mean, this was the classic guy, this was absolutely right decision, use some epi, and that's, this is the type of guy that that epi is gonna save his life probably. You know, it's the Benadryl and steroids probably aren't gonna turn him around. Um, I don't remember how long it had been going on for, but you know, this is the type of anaphylaxis just literally one minute you're fine, you had a peanut, and three minutes later you're in this extremist type situation. Yeah, the Pepsi, Decadron, the steroids important to counteract additional reaction. Essentially the Pepsids act as an H1 and given the Benadryl is an H2, blocking additional histamine, which is causing the hives, causing the itching, causing more dilation of the vessels. So all those together just really counteract to decrease the anaphylaxis reaction. So, you know, we all, everybody in here has seen tons of allergic reactions, probably half the room has had some sort of allergic reaction to something. It's not every day you really truly see the true anaphylaxis, but I'd say this guy was a true anaphylaxis. I didn't think he had an EpiPen with him, was that right? No, oh, he wasn't one, okay. Or did he have a history of having one? He had a before. That's right, yeah. So. He had had some sort of issue before. And his previous reaction was like a month earlier. He what? The, when he was cleaning out the shed, was like a month earlier. Gotcha. So any questions on that? Like I said, we, it's not every day we run into true anaphylaxis, but when we do, again, these are the people that saved that man's life, given that up. Right. Questions? All right, so next case um, is a female in her 80s, chief complaint of uh, difficulty breathing at home um, for hours while at home. How many times have we been on this one? Because you get there and, and our CHFers, our COPDers, what do they want to do? They want to stay home. They don't want to go to the hospital. And so they traditionally get worse and they get worse and they get worse and they get worse. 
And then they decide where I'm so bad now, and we'll call for some help. So we get there, and traditionally, we're behind the eight ball. That's what this crew was at that point. They got there, they uh, very aggressive with your seal, with your CPAP. Uh, she did have COPD. Uh, they moved very quickly. Um, the patient was, once again, shortness of breath, audible crackles through the house. Uh, and they went ahead and elected to go ahead with uh, CPAP very quickly. Now, one of the teaching points here is <clears throat> we did not have a blood pressure, but we started them on CPAP. What's one of the requirements for CPAP? We've got to have a BP. Okay, we've got to make sure and what does it need to be? What is it? <clears throat> Good, at least 90. Okay, because remember, what are we about to do with this CPAP thing? We're generating pressure. Okay, when we generate pressure, we put more pressure on the inferior superior vena cava, which is going to put our preload down, which is going to factor afterload. Okay, so that's one of the points is I understand severe respiratory distress, we need to be aggressive, but we've got to see where we are with our blood pressure. Okay, now if they would have documented, you know, like you know, bounding pulses, you know, it's something you kind of weigh, yes, that's not traditionally a true number, but you know, uh, by paperwork, we really needed a BP here. Uh, but they noticed that, you know, SATs, they were very aggressive with the CPAP, and they got to move forward. Uh, as you can see, the CPAP was started at 5 because uh, it was a COPD patient. Remember, we don't want to leave, go past 5 at that point. Uh, oxygen saturations prior to CPAP were in the 70s. Uh, get her on the stretcher, get an IV very quickly, start with duo neb, did a great job by getting duo neb on board quick. Uh, cardiac monitor once again. <clears throat> Now we get a blood pressure, 128 over 60, so we know we're good there. Uh, and this is on, of course, CPAP, and we're showing an end title of 20. So tr technically, or traditionally, we know that our CHFers are our, tra our COPDers are our trappers. And so typically, we would expect this number to be high, but we've got to think about a couple things. What does end title tell us? When they're in a respiratory acidosis stage, possibly, or they're at an end stage acidotic state, or they're alkalotic. And so as what's happening here is she's been fighting this for so long, we've been staying home, trying to fight this, trying to fight this, and we probably moved from a respiratory acidosis stage, which would be our end titles really high because we're trapped out, until we finally maybe, and I'm not, we don't have an ABG to confirm this, but we've probably started to bottom out our end title CO2 because, and she is breathing fast, so that's gonna blow off some too, so we've gotta kind of weigh that of what's going on at that point with our end types. We get a 12 lead, did a great job, uh, did not note any ST segment, but then we elect to have to intubate her. She's getting very tired. They did a great job documenting, but we gave ketamine IV, which is the required drug for uh, respiratory disease at that point, and we noticed that our ketamine dose is very high. This is a 70 kilo patient, and that works out to be about five milligrams per kilo. Now, is that still within a safe range? There is literature to support that that could be in a safe range, but remember our protocol here is two milligrams per key. And so why do we want to use the uh, ketamine at this point is because we have a beta agonist. And so the point here is that we, we got a, quite a bit of ketamine on board and we got her sedated. Now, we also got her intubated very quickly uh, once again, that uh, they did a very, very nice job documenting where it was at. We added, they added their own peep in. Um, we talked about, you know, negative sounds on their gastrium. Guys, we don't always see this much documentation, but that's very, very good documentation for that because it's going to hold up in court if it ever has to go. Uh, the airway was secured. Uh, this is right before intubation, decreased level of consciousness, becoming uh, heavy rails, really unable to control her airway, and then elected to take it. <clears throat> then post intubation, we talked, they switched over to fentanyl and uh, gave 100 micrograms post uh, intubation, got their decadron on board, <coughs> continued with the dual nib. I can't stress this enough how important it is to continue with our dual nib when it's not a CHF patient. So we got our COPD ears, and we don't think about that a lot. We get them intubated, and we fix their breathing problem, but I'm not fixing the cause of why we were in a breathing problem. And that's our bronchospasms, and so they continued with their dual nebs, did a great job. Saturations came up well, end titles came up well. 
yeah, blood pressure got a little low, but we've also taken off the CPAP quickly. You know, we, what all has happened, you know, with that, we're not sure, but they didn't have a, a lot of other options here. To, they, they probably needed to go ahead and give uh, Versed with it, but they couldn't. <clears throat> the blood pressure was low. So with the new protocol, what options do we have at this point? We have a repeat dose of ketamine. ketamine. Good. And what dose is that at? Two milligrams per kilogram. Okay. So they could have repeated their dose now. Now with having that much of a dose earlier, maybe that was their thought process. Maybe they caught it. Maybe they didn't. I'm not sure. Uh, they went ahead and added some dopamine right here for some pressure support. Great job. Um, they get her uh, almost to the hospital. Blood pressure still marginally, still doing good. We're still perfusing at this point. Um, EMS is starting to back in and notice that the patient is starting to bite the tube. And they went ahead with a good enough pressure now to give Verset. So would we have benefited from possibly two rounds of ketamine? You get a beta 2 agonist with the ketamine. That may have helped on the second side. Um, not sure um, which way that would go. <clears throat> yeah, so I mean to answer that, so ketamine does help a little bit to dilate. You know, we don't just say, well, let's give ketamine try to dilate stuff. I think I don't think it's a wrong answer to not have given ketamine, but maybe it's the best answer to have given the ketamine a try. One thing you want to mention on, so this is a COP deer. So we got them, let's say we got them intubated, and okay, great, our sats are good. We start heading to the hospital, and now our sats are low. What is the most likely issue. COPD are now intubated, positive pressure ventilation. Come on. EG dysphagia, that place. That's a possibility. What else? So COPD is what do they have a high risk? And then that could kind of lead towards pneumothorax, right, yeah, collapse lung, pneumothorax. So I mean, a COPD or that gets on a ventilator, they probably have a, it's in the single digits, two, three, four percent chance of getting a pneumothorax. So don't forget that, because I think we tend to, whether in the ER, in the back of an ambulance, the first thing we think of is dislodge two, which I agree, we have to assess that. But then also you really want at the top, whenever you know this is an old COPD or the greater chance is probably they dropped the along. So think about darting that chest. Well, so we talked a little bit about the IV ketamine dose. I don't think it caused any issue. You know, technically, we could give 20 mg per keg of ketamine and it shouldn't cause an issue. Um, but we need to try to stay within those doses. We talked about the ketamine repeat because there is that little uh, dilation of the bronchioles may be helpful. Who else, who in here has given ketamine for RSI or PAI? What do you think? It sucks. It sucks? I think people have a false sense of how long it's gonna last. So like you're more so is your problem like you don't get them intubated for it where it's off or you've got them intubated and put it No, down? yeah, no, they come back around faster than after they're intubated. Dr. Trump when I was on this call. Yep. He was supposed to stay anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> we they we gave way too much ketamine. Yeah. I mean put this lady down. I mean, boom, we intubated her, everything's good. By the time I got that tube secured, she was awake. And she didn't have a pressure. Her pressure was in the can. So, and the ketamine, yeah, now we know uh, at that time we didn't have uh, some paperwork that we kind of needed. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's why I ended up having <coughs> dopamine on her to get the pressure up. But this lady linked it up all the way to the hospital. And I felt like that is not what we are here to do. And uh, a lot of that is, is, is my fault um, with the protocol itself. But, um, so I would say, I don't think that the increased dose of ketamine caused the hypotension. No, I, don't, I can't remember what it's working. I mean, it probably you could have gave anything. And it just seems like some people post intubation, they drop the pressure a little bit, then they sometimes usually come back up. I doubt it was a ketamine. Um, you're right on the eye blinking. So what does ketamine do? How does it work? It's a dissociative. Right. So you kind of just think you like 
pluck the top of the brain off the brain stem. And so you still have some of those reflexes and stuff stay there. Uh, you've probably seen that on some of the synthetic marijuana and cannabis type patients. So, you know, there is this, well, they're blinking at me, so are they filling everything? Do they know what's going on? Probably not. Technically, they shouldn't with the ketamine. Right. I think we're just having mixed reviews. I mean, we use, I used a ketamine the other night, and we used ketamine, Nurkron, Versed, and uh, fentanyl. And, I mean, our guy, he stayed, well, of course, it was the, 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 the Nurkron, but, I mean, <laughs> there was, yeah. <laughs> But there was no change in in pressure. There was no change in heart rate. Though I mean, he stayed sedated and he stayed under. So I do. I think it's just from patient to patient. We're just getting mixed results. Right. Well, we've got him in the same synthetic guy three times now, and it well, he eats through it. He's he through eats it through it so fast. He's been intubated electively twice in the ER. And I pretty much swore the next time we run on him, we'll just innovate and go with it because he won't go down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing more of that. Um, just where, you know, where's the, the dose of ketamine? You know, two years from now, going to be even higher just because we have people that are tolerant and certainly having a drug history potentially makes the dose needed even higher. Was this patient on any narcotics or anything chronically, do you know? Or? I don't I think so. And, and, and this lady was, she was, like Chad said, she waited way too long. You know, she, was, she was in the can way before right. we ever got there. Um, and, and that's what I'm wondering is, is when, we, when we do use the ketamine on these patients, what, how fast is the ketamine being, you know, being absorbed and used, you know, and eaten through with people who are, you know, as far, you know, with the with the respiratory rate, the way they are, the way they're breathing, and then you give them you give them a drug that basically knocks everything out, and you get them intubated and you take over. Where do we stand with knowing kind of how how their body's going to react to that? You talk about just reacting to the ketamine. Yeah. <clears throat> and you, you think about another thing. You use it. You know, old school. We did accommodate on these reactive airways. You know, what does what is, uh, automate do? You know, um, it's just so fast. I mean, I, times I've used it, you can't really tell. It's not predictable. I mean, some people are grabbing at it, and some people are doing the blinking. And, and, then, and then I've read many that are just flaccid the whole time, yeah. and they're, they're done. So I think, you know, we're probably, and I, I bet it's closer to 50 50 now with these couple more cases. Uh, and I know. Uh, Luis, you got two now. Yeah, two. 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 They woke one, up pretty quick. Last one the guy was trying to get out. And of they're all been respiratory. I, I mean, as far as the ketamine working, the grain we over from this lady, the ketamine. But as far as it getting the, you know, they're down to the end, that works wonderful. I mean, she's, she was out. It's, like, kind of, it's great, but it's but like I mean, post I'm, two, we need to maybe work on. You're talking, I mean, I'm talking less than less than four minutes from the time the tube was in. She was blinking her eyes and looking around. And you know, pressure on So maybe we need to look at kind of laying it out better in the protocols or <coughs> see how other folks can. I'm assuming we're not the only one that's had this issue. You know, in ketamine, as you all know, you go back two years ago, almost nobody used it. Now more and more people are, even for RSI. Do we need to end up having it in protocol? Like, okay, you use ketamine, tube secured, boom, you get this. Is that another dose of ketamine? Is that a dose of Merced? Oh, no. we'll, let's look at that. I think that's something good. We need to look at. You know, we'll talk at Eagles. What a about it. you know? I've I've brought this up a lot of times too. You know, I don't know how well you, you look at this uh, humans towards animals, but you know, I used it on the horses a lot. Right. And you know, it made me think about more and more what uh, the more and more I've thought about this over listening to people talk about these <coughs> and. Uh, you know, I can remember when we would give it to a horse IV. Of course, we'd always give them ACE along with it. What's uh, ACE? Like an ACE inhibitor? Or? No, it's uh, it's oh, like a it's like yeah, it's ACE probably It's like a Benz. Okay. And we would give them you know that, and the horse would you know he would be with it like if he touched his eyes he'd blink and he right. kind of, but we could do our surgeries. Right. And you know he he didn't flinch much. It's like Doctor Trapman was saying you know they're blinking. But they're not home. Right. 
you know, you still have those functions to blink and maybe do things, but their their brain is disconnected. Because that horse would just stand there. I mean, we did some pretty brutal things to that horse. <laughs> And you know they just stand there. We do, you know, do like we do, do do skin. Brutal. And, you did surgery. <laughs> it was brutal. <laughs> it was brutal what we did. <laughs> His name was Don. <laughs> <laughs> I also have the same response to using ketamine uh, for pain. Uh, I've had a couple. Of, I've had a hip fracture. I tried to use ketamine on, and after putting him on the stretcher and getting him secure and stuff, it was great. Because he was snowed. Five minutes later, he's waking. And he is just riding in pain. And we've actually, because we get point five minutes for ten. Uh, yes. And which actually, actually, yeah, everywhere you look, it should be point two, point three. We actually give a quote big dose. Yeah, and I do want to say you mentioned overdose. Five minutes for ten is not overdose. I think if you look at the pharmacopeia, well, ten to twenty. I mean, <laughs> but high protocol. Yeah. So, so maybe we have some work to do on our ketamine protocols. And that's why we're going to take these. We'll look at you know, trying to put everything I've taken his two cases and kind of trying to, and is what we've seen is they've all been pretty much COPD years and we've had one CH effort so they've been all the respiratory cause we most of the, all the synthetics have stayed down I mean well, no, that's what's except interesting. for the new fella yeah because what I you know I still get some feedback from physicians <clears throat> your medics are just given ketamine to everybody on the street and they're snowing and they have to lay in the ER for 15 hours till I can examine them. But then I'm here, <coughs> here, and man, we barely get the tube in and they're wide awake wanting to run off the gurney. It's like, which way is it? But I can, I'll deal with the people on the, uh, keeping them knocked down for the aggressive behavior. So that's to protect you guys, and which I know we're all clear on that. You know, we only should give that ketamine when they're very aggressive or we're kind of worried about our own or their own kind of Issue, you know, if there's four people having to hold them down, they need ketamine. Yeah. I think we do a good job with that. And I think the ER is seeing more of it, but I think that's because you guys are seeing more people that are aggressive out there on the streets. I don't think we're giving it willy nilly. And let me say that's something that does help us with your documentation. Y'all have done a great job, but tell us how many first responders it takes to hold them down. That drives a point home. Yep. Really yeah, one the other day it was like nine, I think is what the number we had to count through the report. There's nine people holding this this gentleman down and, and so document that. Oh, that sounds tough, but literally I'll get a text from a doctor that says, Oh, they gave this and this, I think they probably shouldn't have done it. So usually I'll text him and he'll look at the reports like, Well, they they have, you know, two police officers and three firemen riding the gurney. So you know, I tell the guy, Man, we had eight people riding this guy leave my guys alone they did the right job they should have snowed him even more yeah. <laughs> all right we'll go to the next one okay any questions <coughs> all right so uh case four is a uh, category 10 160 pounds 72 kilo female in her six early 60s uh sharp chest pain uh but the pain is actually presented for many hours now pain radiates to her back but there's pertinent negatives here was documented very well. No shortness of breath, no nausea, and no obvious diaphoresis. And you can see this, she denies any of these things. And guys, remember your pertinent negatives are just as great as your pertinent positives are. Uh, and so they did a very nice job with the documentation here. <coughs> very good job getting a cardiac monitor on within three minutes. Uh, I'm sorry, four minutes did a great job. And this is the initial on lead two. And so immediately we're going, remember if we got it in two, our quick six, we're looking at an inferior wall at that point. Did a great job with the oxygen, got a blood pressure, got everything they needed. Uh, sinus rhythm, pain scale was 10 on 10. Uh, EKG uh, was recorded twice. Um, see, it's telling me, hey, I'm really what I think it is. They did a good job with transmission. Uh, and you can document, they, they talk about here, uh, they do know some elevation uh, throughout the 12 lead. Now, at the end of the day, we would like this a lot more specific. Where are you seeing it at? And most, I would venture to say that a lot of staff does a great job documenting with that. But it's where it really matters at the end of the day is with Ms. Darla. Because Ms. Darla needs that to be very, very specific with what we're calling it. Because with the 
all the new stuff i mean it's a headache for her it's like pages and hundreds of thousands of pages of stuff for her to sort through so we need to be very very specific here of exactly what is and i know we've talked about inferior and you're going to see a little bit more here this is what the first 12 lead looks like <clears throat> you can see we're depressed we're pretty big big all throughout we got some reciprocal changes we're moving over you know septals looking decent we're starting to increase as we move uh, to our anterior leads and posterior leads so we're getting tinkering with tinkering with here a almost global mi at this point we're getting pretty close we're seeing a lot of injury pattern at that point uh, definitely something that's going to cause us some problem or cause this patient some problems here in a little bit as you can see once again the the elevation of the reciprocal changes <clears throat> so uh, they got an iv blood draw aspirin did their whole thing we got nitro on board now one of the significant things is this patient took three nitroglycerin before we got there so does that fully give you the ability to move straight to a narcotic if you need to in an opiate? <coughs> sure, it does. It does. But what are some of the things we want to know? Do you have a headache? You know, is your nitro a date? Is it da 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 da? Because I still like, remember, I'm not going to get a lot of vasodilatation effect out of that fentanyl. In fact, probably none for my fentanyl. So is, where, is what that fentanyl is is a comfort measure at that point for her to reduce that anxiety, to reduce that uh, that's that hurt load but it's where I'm getting my main benefit is nitroglycerin they did a very good job they went straight to at least one nitro from us right now and that was a very good thought process because that's what's opening those vessels as minimally as the nitro is actually going to open it uh, but they had a good blood pressure they did another 12 lead nice serial 12 leads with this um, still didn't report uh, any really other changes but now the pain is stating it's radiating to her upper back now, and she is associating with some shortness of breath. So does that tell me this, this 12 leads expanding? Is her MI expanding? You know, it's kind of hard to say uh, at that point. Uh, <clears throat> another set of vital signs. Now we're becoming very hypertensive. That's one of those big signs that my body's trying its hardest to perfuse what needs to be perfused. And so that would tell me that I probably have an expansion in my MI. Need to be very aggressive. Once again, right back to nitro. Did a very, very good job. They ended up getting some fentanyl in um, on board. So who feels like we do too many EKGs? I mean, how many EKGs do you do compared to you find this? It's a ton, right? I saw an article once in a typical community-based ER, the doctor will look at usually around 200 to 250 EKGs before they see one STEMI. Seems like a lot, right? So the biggest thing that we can do on a patient like this is find that STEMI, right? So, you know, we did a good job on that, was having chest <coughs> pain, which for the most part, almost anybody with chest pain, we're gonna get an EKG, but sometimes it feels like a pain or sometimes there's that upper abdominal pain or abdominal pain, certainly if they're older, you know, why are we having to get these EKGs? But if you talk to the folks that's been doing it a while, they all, again, have that weird abdominal pain story that turns out to be a STEMI. So recognition, getting it quickly, getting it transmitted over to the ER, and ideally trying to start getting the cath lab team mobilized. So I'm assuming by the ED care on this, was this on a, one of the snow, yeah. the snow, the snow or complex or whatever? So we gave Lytix, which I've done one time in my career, actually was moonlighting a small ER in rural Mississippi and had a STEMI come in. I was like, oh, I need the helicopter. Called helicopter, not, we're grounded. Crap, what do I do with this STEMI? I'm like three hours from the cath lab. So you get to go read about, okay, which, how do I get these Lytix? <coughs> Some of the folks been doing this a while probably remembered when largely everybody got Lytix. So Lytix isn't a bad option. The best is, the gold standard is PCI within 90 minutes. If you can't make that standard, then the plan is to give Lytics. There's a number of them out there. Um, team Case, ATP Lace, there's a bunch of these ACEs that go in and bust up the clot, theoretically. So they gave that. Um, oftentimes, you, you learn about when you give Lytics, you kind of get this or I was taught you just ignore the EKG monitor because it'll just freak you out. 
because they're going to change. They're going to go to VTAC, BFib. You're not supposed to treat anything for, I forget, there's a period of time. Like, you should ignore EKGs for like two hours after you get that because that's just the heart kind of going through all these rhythms. And ideally, it goes in, breaks up the clot, and you have a, a clot free heart afterward. So, and then this case, they did end up taking the patient, I guess, to the cath lab later and did find a RCA, it sounds like, totally occluded. And I'm assuming they put a stent in there. Um, any questions? So, you know, stimmies kind of becomes the bread and butter. The best thing we can do is recognize it. We're one more person in that chain to find that. Well, my elbow kind of hurts over here and I've got diabetes and it turns out it's STEMI. You know, maybe the ER missed it, but you picked it up. So again, everybody has those stories too. Cool. Last case. So the point home is they did a great job with aggressive nitro, even though we've had nitro yep. at home. But remember, that's where our vasodilatation, that's where going to be our help is. And I actually mentioned this. Notice what the ED did. Uh, so they didn't read the newest literature. I mean, it, the literature almost came out and said, like, you should not give morphine to patients with STEMI. But maybe I shouldn't say that. That's why we switched yeah. to fentanyl. <laughs> yeah. And remember, do you remember what the concern was? It's an issue with, so why do we give aspirin to try to help decrease platelet aggregation? The morphine interferes with that. So I don't think it completely blocks the aspirin effect, but it blocks it somewhat. Plavix. That's why I went to, is it the Plavix? Plavix. One, one of the ones. Yeah. It, it, it messes up the coagulation, or the stop of coagulation that we try to get. The morphine can cause problems with that. So fentanyl is the drug of choice, certainly in a known stimulant. Some people say it in any chest pain. Okay. So this is her uh, cath in the cath lab. As you can see, we've got it playing over here. I, you probably can explain uh, this. No, I know. I know a lot better than me. She ended up having, this is the RCA, the right side of the heart. Remember that one of the big take home messages here is right up in the top third of the RCA is where the SA artery comes in. If her occlusion would have been a little higher, we probably could have got in. That's why our right sided MIs a lot of times will become bradycardic so quick is because if it affects that SA artery that feeds the SA node, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. She was actually about halfway down on a pretty good size occlusion there. You can see that her flow is very poor uh, there on that posterior aspect. So uh, this is actually the live video, or not live, but the video from uh, her cath that we wanted to share with you guys so you can kind of see what was going on. Any questions on that? Okay. This one? Yeah. I think we got a I mean, yeah, we kind so, of. So, you know, I mean, everybody knows what the classic STEMI patient looks like. You know, the 70 year old male that's a smoker with hypertension diabetes, who's <coughs> on sort of chest pain, they're diaphoretic, nauseated, and it radiates down their left arm. But, you know, how many patients present like that? Like 10% maybe? And it's true, not everybody that's having a STEMI, they just don't look sick. I remember, I have a, this was before, I think I was a freshman in college. May have been a senior in high school. I think I was a senior in high school. My, you know, in Wichita Falls, my grandparents, they didn't live too far. And grandmother called and said, Poppy's been having chest pain. Okay, and, you know, so we just went over there. I mean, none of us know anything about medicine, but you go over, he just says, one chest has been hurt. I don't know, is that a heart attack? And, you know, just to the lay person, you kind of think, I think like they would hurt worse, but they've been hurting him all day, so we went to the ER. Turns out he was having a LCA, STEMI, gut cats. So, again, you've all seen that. Not every STEMI patient just looks like crap. A lot of them do, but not all of them do. We talked about the fit now. Okay, cool. So, let's talk about our report of the month. So, uh, we spawned to a restaurant for category 10, uh, females in her 50s, reporting sharp pain, left sided, uh, since 1400. I cannot stress enough how many phone calls I get from cardiology in a week and they say what was the time and I know for Darla this makes a big difference but time is a huge thing especially for cardiology right now cardiology has to show proof of an EMS 12 lead I get a phone call a week for the cath lab saying I need a 12 lead for this patient 
and until HL7 comes in, which will be the uh, bridge system for reporting all this, it'll, it'll electronically go to the chart. It's going to be kind of a pain for a little bit. But as you can see, uh, they did a, uh, just an incredible job documenting here. Uh, talk about what fire, what happened before they got there. Very specific with times that they were, she was, that the patient was given medication. When it started, a perfect time. Um, moving down to how my pain went. Uh, and then talked about even how about the patient having a sinus infection. Talked, went into great detail about uh, all of the history the patient had, full list of medications. Uh, very, very nice job with the documentation. As you can see, their first assessment even talks about the left chest pain documented being dull. Uh, well, between sharp and dull pain, uh, broke it down, uh, talking about patient was dry to the touch. Cardiac monitor went into great detail about uh, that initially it was a sinus tack and no signs of ectopy at that time, which I know is documented at the bottom, but reiterated. <coughs> um, bottle signs once again, and then did their 12 lead. Uh, also followed up uh, with what the monitor said and then what their interpretation of that was. Uh, we see it kind of mixed. Half the people will erase it and put their dictation in there. Some will leave what Zoll's, Dr. Zoll, is it Dr. Zoll, is that right? Okay. What Dr. Zoll says and then put their, uh, some people will put uh, medic remarks and, and document what they feel. Uh, but that is very important at that point of what the medic feels like is going on. Because at the end of the day, I don't always trust Dr. Zoll, but I trust what you guys are reading. And so I think, and I think the cardiologist appreciate that because you're seeing, I don't know how many times I looked at it, it says AFib on, the Dr. Zoll says it's AFib, and there ain't no way it's AFib. I mean, it's perfect. You got nice P's and QRS's. It's just, it's picking up certain things and it may be bouncing down the road and that's what's causing some of it. But your dictation in here is a very important part. You can see that the uh, 12 lead, not anything just super impressive, nothing that's just standing out uh, until Dr. Zoll says that there is a significant Q wave in uh, lead three, which, yeah, okay, once again, very difficult uh, to see uh, on that. Not the cleanest 12 lead in the world, but um, you did what we could. Very good job with uh, documentation, once again, uh, breaking it down exactly what uh, had happened and uh, prior to with her taking some nitro before we got there. An IV did a great job with blood pressures, talking about everything, how we progressed, began with nitro again. Okay, we're doing, giving this due to chest pain continuing. Um, <clears throat> once again, followed up and then very thorough, uh, further documentation. Guys, a lot of times we see a great initial assessment and then the second one will be no changes. And, and I understand that there's no changes, but this, in this state, especially with chest pains, because there usually is some change, but they'll say minimal change or something. They've gone in just totally, totally documented exactly what was going on with each case. Uh, once again, in the primary assessment, very thorough. EMS will take a 12 lead, uh, two additional nitro, no changes. I mean, just broke it down uh, verbatim what had happened. It made you feel like when you were reading this that you were on that call. Um, so for this month, Dr. Troutman will talk about this. For this month, to uh, since we have a little outdoorsman here, Mr. Sawyer Hugator, congratulations. Uh, I guess little Cabela's on, on us. <clears throat> so this patient older has history of uh, essentially CVA, right? Yeah, had stents placed. So we know they have bad arteries already, right? They've already defined that as diabetes. So this patient's screaming, I potentially have another heart problem, right? And on top of that, having shortness of breath, chest pain, but of course not a STEMI. So no STEMI. And was this, is on the next slide, didn't we have the troponin? No. I thought it was, it was in there. The other one. The oh, other chest well, pain. that was the last yes, one. Another hospital. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so, troponin, y'all should be familiar with that, you know, the troponin comes off the heart whenever it's injured, right? So, how long, like right now, if I'm having a heart attack, when can I detect troponin in the bloodstream? Do I take my blood 30 minutes from now and detect it? Probably not. Sometimes in just a terrible 
big Widowmaker STEMI? Maybe. Usually it's four to six hours minimum, but usually the gold standard is really getting out there eight to 12 hours before we can really say pretty low likelihood of this being a cardiac event. But even then, so let's, and I think this patient was 12 hours out. I think they said their chest pain started about 1800 and the call was like 6, 7 a.m. So you, you, the reason we put this in is you're seeing a lot more, we're seeing a lot more troponins because they're going to these the smaller clinics sometimes or maybe the freestandings and they're giving you this information. And so that's why we wanted to talk about troponin here just a little bit. Yeah, so this patient very well, 6, 7 a.m., could have got a troponin that was elevated. If that's the case, that's a non-STEMI and an in-STEMI, non-ST elevation MI. If you have elevated troponin, it comes from cardiac injury, which you didn't have the EKG changes. So those patients tend to get more what we call delayed PCI. They often will end up in a cardiac ICU on a, like a platelet aggregator um, infusion and then often gets a PCI or a cath in the next 24, 48 hours. But even this patient, I saw her in the ER, this has been going on 12 hours and her troponin's negative. With all these risk factors, she's gonna get ruled out. So she's gonna get some sort of stress test either treadmill or where they do like a nuclear med scan, or even she's just gonna to go to the cath lab anyways, and we'll go in and take a look. So the instimies are a little bit harder to determine, you know, because can you admit every single 80 year old that comes in with chest pain? No, you almost wish sometimes you could, but if we did that, our hospitals would even be more full than they are. So you make a judgment call sometimes, and, and you base that on What's their story? Does their story sound good? What's their risk factors? You know, it said that she's had ACS. Well, that just happened six months ago and she had two stints then. If she's taken her Plavix or, or whatever um, platelet aggregator inhibitor, there's probably a much lower chance. Now, if she had ACS 12 years ago, probably a lot greater chance. So you just kind of get away all those, put them together and make that decision on if there's somebody that's 12 hours out with a normal troponin, do I need to admit them? Or you know, we have like an observation unit at UMC where then they can do a stress test in the morning. Any other? That's about that on that one. It's a good job, Doc. I mean, this was a very solidly put together report for sure. I don't have nothing else. Any questions? Questions?